Okay, so this is an exciting day because we get to talk about uh, metabolism, pharmacology, all the different kinds of drugs and how we classify drugs. Um, so it's uh, one of the largest um, pieces of evidence that you see in terms of volume in a crime lab is drug-related materials. And so this, this course, will I call it Baby Talks, Baby Toxicology and Pharmacology, because it's all in like one half of a lecture, whereas they have whole courses in it. So we're just going to sort of fly over the Grand Canyon of toxicology, and I'm going to say, if you look out your right window on the right, you can see the Grand Canyon. <laughs> Big Canyon. Okay, so we're going to do that with toxicology and pharmacology. Um, and so uh, let's just sort of back up, though, and say, you know, where does this fit into things? Well, we're classifiers, right? We're not necessarily analytical chemists in that we're going to analyze something until we identify exactly what it is. We're classifying it, whether it's forensically relevant or not. And so, like, if you have a red material, is it biological or not? If it's not, you're done. If it's biological, is it blood or not blood? If it's not, then you're done. Then you move your way down. And then this is the best case where you could get to individualization. So you could get it classified down to an individual. Maybe you can't do that. Maybe it's been degraded and you can't get enough DNA. You just have to say, well, it's human blood. That's all we have. And so this biology, this whole idea is something that requires a knowledge of pharmacology. Um, now, toxicology as well, this is a phrase that my kids learned from me uh, constantly. You know, they pick something up off the ground and throw it in their mouth and they would smile and say, the toxin is the dose, right? <laughs> a little bit of dirt's not gonna kill me. And I, and I always say, yeah, but that doesn't apply to biological things, right? Because <laughs> they can multiply. So make sure it didn't get into some ick, as we say. Ick is the catch-all for anything biological in our family. Don't step in the ick, okay? And so then uh, this idea of, of drugs, again, the toxin is the dose. So drugs introduce or induce some sort of physiological change. It could be a stimulation, it could be a depression, it could be all kinds of, of different things. And then uh, there's a sort of a window at which they do different things. So there might be a concentration dependent response all the way up to a toxic response where they're toxic to the body because the dose is high. And a poison is essentially an, an overdosed active agent. Okay. So the toxin is the dose. That's what we mean by that. Um, and medicines are not just the active ingredient. They have other things like maybe time control or time release agents, um, things that just make the medicine in a formulation that is larger than uh, it needs to be just so that the person doesn't overdose. You know, if you look at a, at a tablet that says 100 milligrams of some active agent or maybe even 80 milligrams, and then you go up here in the lab, and you weigh out 0 0.08 grams of something, it's gonna be a tiny little something. And, and if you press that into a tablet and gave that to somebody, they would look at it and say, there's no way that's gonna be enough. I'm gonna take three, right? Because it's so small. How could that be enough for this headache? I've got such a bad headache. I need three of those or five of those. Um, so they, they actually expand the size of the pills on purpose so that you say, oh, that's a pill, and I don't need, you know, I'm just going to take one. You look at the, like, when you go to the, get prescription ibuprofen, you know, it's like a horse pill. <laughs> it's only 4.4 4 grams. I mean, that's, that's quite a bit of material, but it's still, it's, um, it's not that big. And so that's what we call a medicine. It has all the drugs and other formulary components. And then these different definitions of drugs of abuse change over time, and we've got some new ones in this set of uh, notes today. So this toxin is the dose. Even water can be taken at a, at a toxic level. So this is a um, tragic event on many college campuses. They know from the student handbook that they can't do drinking games or haze with alcohol. And so in the past, some uh, fraternities um, have switched to water, some sort of hazing. So they'll make them drink water and not allow them to pee. And they've killed people doing that. Uh, this was a, a University of California Chico student died drinking water, 21 years old. And then this is the tragic story of a mother of, of, uh, of three, uh, or no, mother of four, who died um, in a drinking game, Jennifer Strange. It was uh, this, this uh, program or, or contest they had with the radio uh, station on remote, and it was back when the Wii was really popular. And their, their little game show was hold your Wii for a Wii. 
And so they had everybody try to drink water every five minutes or 10 minutes of bottled water. Um, and the last one to pee won the week. And so it was a really funny radio game. They're making all kinds of jokes because it's a funny name and everything like that. And she started complaining about headaches and nausea. And the radio host said, "What? it's just water. It's not going to kill you. You know, hang in there. And it did kill her. So, uh, so it's pretty tragic. So then because of all of the evidence from the radio hosts and everything, uh, they definitely settled out of court. They, they you know, acknowledged their culpability and, and, you know, it was a huge settlement. So if you type in that little link from your emails, you can see the news report. There's also classification of drugs by origin. So acid-base character, which we really emphasized in the last couple of notes because of liquid-liquid extraction, not really going to talk to a jury very well, right? This is a basic drug or whatever. Basic to them is like not complicated. <laughs> it had nothing to do with protonation or deprotonation. It's like, that's yeah, a basic drug. It's like, not like one of those complicated drugs. Um, so that's, uh, it's good for chemists, but not necessarily for juries or law enforcement. So origin may be much more useful. Like, is this a plant extract? If it's a plant extract from seeds, plants, then it's called an alkaloid. Um, like morphine is an alkaloid and, and a lot of the opiates, um, but then heroin is a semi-synthetic. So semi-synthetic because they start with morphine and then they do some chemistry on it and they acetylate it. So they take acetic acid or acetic anhydride and they, they put acetyl groups on wherever there were OH groups. And we'll get into the chemistry of that later. Then other drugs of origin or other origins of drugs are like 100% synthetic, like Valium, you know, diazepam. So that's a, a, a drug made um, by the pharmaceutical industry to, to manage anxiety. And it's, again, 100% synthetic. And then you have these catch-all category called designer drugs or experimental drugs, where people are um, ingesting all kinds of things, like things called bath salts. These are natural extracts that are, quote, made for softening skin in the bath, right? But no, people eat them or smoke them or whatever. So, you know, you'll find these in convenience stores and, and you're like, why are they selling bath salts at the convenience store? Well, they're not for your bath, okay? People actually ingest them. And so this gets into this uh, uh, PhD study that Stephanie Wesselier did on Kratom. So that was, you'll see, and there's a sign on 11th Street if you're going along and it's a big old banner, it says Kratom, you know, so they're selling it right here in Huntsville. You see CBD oil and all these kinds of things. And so this is, uh, this is an alkaloid. It's a, a plant extract. And she wanted to look in the literature and as she made this, her study was uh, to look at all of the detection techniques and screening techniques to see if this person also had Kratom in their body. Like if they pass away, was it a opiate addiction, uh, overdose, or maybe it was a Kratom. And they, they detect opiates and they say, oh, it was opiates and classify it as an opiate death, but maybe it was a Kratom death. They don't have good analytical methods for Kratom, they're gonna miss it. And so they think that some of the um, use of Kratom is underreported because there's not a good set of methods. So that was her thing, an improved detection of Kratom alkaloids and forensic toxicology. So this is Kratom. Um, it comes in, you know, powders, capsules, extracts, leaf cuttings, and so on. It was a, originally a cultural practice in Southeast Asia. They would chew the leaves, <clears throat> very similar to how, how aspirin was discovered. They would chew the leaves and, and the bark of the tree to relieve pain. And so that's how they discovered aspirin as an analgesic. Same thing here in Thailand, where it just grows naturally. Uh, the, the, you know, the original people would just chew this plant, chew the leaves, and uh, have an effect on it. Um, again, it's, uh, it's used recreationally as an opiate replacement and for uh, the non-medically supervised treatment of opiate addiction. So if you have Kratom and opiate, you, opiate addiction, you can, you can probably realize that people are going to be swapping those out. So when they start feeling withdrawal from opiates, they start using Kratom to manage that withdrawal until they get another set of opiates. Uh, here's the, the compounds. These are the main ones. There's 40 compounds present in the leaves, but they seem to be the, the top uh, compounds. Now, what do you recognize in these particular compounds? 
So what kind of chemistry do you recognize as a, as a chemist? Yeah, so they definitely have this same sort of ring structure here, right, with different, different parts added on. So that would be a, the recognizable ring structure. Again, that's going to be a particular mass in a mass spectrum, so you're going to be able to easily detect it if you use mass spectra because you'll see this, this main peak, you know, of the molecular ion, that contains all of those rings, fairly unique structure, and then you're going to have small differences based on the species. What about acid-base character? Yeah, it looks like an acid-base, but it's an ester. It's got a methyl group on it. Okay. It's got a methoxy here. It's got an OH here, but it's it's not really connected to an aromatic ring, so that's not going to be a very pH active uh, proton. Um, if it was on an aromatic ring, you might be have a have a, a phenol like pKa, which would be around ten. So you could get it to to deprotonate above pH of ten. We've got a nitrogen here with lone pairs that would be pH active, and this is a tertiary amine as well, and it's going to have lone pair. So these are dibases. So they have two basic nitrogens, and so you'll have two pKa's that will be. Um, Probably in, in the you know mildly basic region, so a little bit above seven, but but probably definitely lower than ten. So you could uh, you could protonate this base, get it to go into the aqueous phase if you were doing a liquid liquid extraction, if you had enough to detect that way. Uh, there's other ways to classify these again by origin. The, this classification of designer drugs, um, this uh, bath salts or cathinones. If you hear cathinones, they're talking about bath salts. Um, they're uh, taken from the cat plant, and uh, they're cheap substitutes for other stimulants. So sometimes to, to mask the absence of cocaine, they'll stick in some of these other cheaper alternatives. Sort of this uh, molly or MDMA sometimes has uh, synthetic cathinones instead, so they've substituted it out. So they swallow, snort, smoke, or inject these different cathinones. It's still unknown how they affect the brain. They cause paranoia, um, increased sociability, which is again, that kind of alcohol effect of reducing uh, your inhibitions, um, increased sex drive, so they say, uh, hallucinations and panic attacks. So again, that's some uh, maybe different effects on different people, but also mixed in there is the different effects of the different dosing. So it's hard to say that this drug does this thing because there's a dose response too. So at higher doses or lower, lower doses, you'll have uh, different effects. And so these effects are what we're talking about, the physiological consequences, and analgesic is something that relieves pain. And that was really, uh, when I talked about aspirin, that was like a miracle drug. You think aspirin's not very, not very exciting, right? But they had pain relievers, they had analgesics before aspirin, that were opiates, and opiates are addictive. And so when they discovered aspirin, it was the first non-addictive pain reliever. So that's fantastic. It can relieve pain without creating a dependency or a euphoric feeling. It doesn't hit the euphoric centers of the brain. So you take aspirin, you don't go, oh yeah, I gotta have another aspirin. You take aspirin, the pain goes away, and if the pain doesn't return, you don't have a craving for more aspirin. Okay, so that's that's what makes those opiates addictive is that euphoric feeling. Um, then there's also depressants. Depressants attenuate the central nervous system. That's what CNS stands for, central nervous system. And these would be things like barbiturates, but the most common depressant is alcohol. Okay, and benzodiazepines. Now, as a high school kid in health, remember health in high school? Yeah. So I'm in this class taught by a coach and and I'm listening about you know, all these different drugs and the coach is talking about this is a depressant, you know, and I'm thinking, who wants to be depressed? <laughs> right. As a kid, I could not understand why you would take a drug that would make you depressed. That's not the kind of depression we're talking about. We're talking about, you know, muting this anxiety and so on. So a lot of these depressants like alcohol and so on are 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 taken because of the stress 
of life and so on, trying to mute that ang anxious feeling in your in your central nervous system. And, and it also, again, has that uh, I, that ability, if you mute that, those anxiety feelings, then you also make yourself less self-aware. And that's where the, the reduction of inhibitions comes from. And so you're less self-aware, you, you know, you, you think, uh, if you're a guy, you think you're Superman, you know, I can do this. It's the origin of the hold my beer and watch this type attitude, <laughs> you know, and that's, uh, that's typically what, you know, if they had the little black box cockpit recorder uh, on, on trucks in Texas, you know, most fatalities would probably be that the last thing they said, you know, hold my beer and watch this. And every other state would probably be oh blank, you know, as they're crashing, but in Texas, it's like, yeah. So hallucinant, uh, hallucinogens, you, you have different types of hallucinations. In fact, you've all probably had hallucinations uh, without drugs. Uh, a hallucination, <laughs> a hallucination, yeah. A hallucination is any false signal, right? What is a false signal? You ever reach for your phone thinking it buzzed? And you look and you don't have any notification. You feel a little vibration and you're, that's a hallucination. That's a tactile hallucination. Yeah. You ever hear, hear something that's not there, you know, maybe, maybe less, less likely. Seeing something, that's typically what we think of when we think of hallucination, but it's really any false psychological signal is a hallucination. And you can kind of classify them in terms of their severity. Feeling something that's not really there, that's, that's the most common. We have those with our little buzzing phones. Um, hearing something that's not there is way more common. Um, because white noise, if you hear white noise, your, your brain will put stuff in that, that noise. A, a really noisy fan in the bathroom and the shower is really loud and I will hear music. I will, my brain will trick me in that white noise of hearing things that aren't there. It's just white noise. But my brain's putting in all of these frequencies because it's got lots of data, lots of noise. Um, seeing something that's not there, I haven't done that. Okay, um, But because that's, again, a little higher on the level. Having all three at once like talking to a person who's not there, um, that's really high level hallucination. So there, there are people that have studied hallucinations and this combination of effects, okay? What they've never seen is, is, uh, is multi-party hallucination. Like you and I see the same thing and talk to them, okay? So there's no documented cases where you share in a hallucination. I'll just throw that out there, okay? Um, this, of course, you know, you've, Heard of you know the the, uh, the mushrooms, mescaline, um, LSD, but marijuana at high dose and high dose meth can can get in there. THC can cause hallucinations at a high enough dose, and that's the thing that worries me so much about vaping THC. They take away CBD, they concentrate the THC, and you go f f fast through the concentration range of the mellow. Uh, you know, marijuana of the 60s into the psychotic range or the hallucination range. And so that's really dangerous, especially for young folks that don't have any kind of tolerance associated with it. So, you know, a high school kid gets a vape pen that's got THC in it, can really, you know, harm themselves. If they start hallucinating. And then there's narcotics, which again is that combination of an analgesic, a central nervous system depressant. These are all of the opiates, of course. And then put in there also the fentanyl and then stimulants that stimulate the central nervous system like caffeine, cocaine, and methamphetamines. So all these different effects, you see some things are in multiple categories. And again, that's, a, that's that concentration uh, response or dose response. So Kratom's effects are also dose dependent. So this is back to Stephanie's um, presentation where again, low doses produce simulant effect and then high doses produce an opiate-like effect. And so uh, she goes in, actually has some, some LD50s for mice of, of uh, roughly 500 milligrams per kilogram. It's a pretty high dose if you think about how many, how many kilograms you weigh and that'd be half a gram per kilogram. That's, that's a huge dose. Uh, so it's not acutely toxic. You know, a small amount will not kill you, but uh, you overdo it. So the, the desired effects are euphoria, alertness, uh, easing that opiate withdrawal symptoms, uh, pain relief and sedation, but the, the adverse effects, so the side effects are impaired me memory, nausea, all kinds of things, hepatoxicity, that's indicating liver, so liver toxicity, 
uh, weight loss, constipation, psychosis, insomnia, a lot of the same kinds of uh, side effects as opiate. Uh, so uh, opiates uh, cause constipation as well. Again, what, what is that? Well, your, your GI is soft muscle tissue and that soft muscle tissue has to, has to constantly go on its, on its schedule of contraction and release to move everything through. Well, if you, if you take a, a, um, a, something that depresses your central nervous system and it stops that soft muscle contraction and release, nothing's moving through. And so it's just natural that if you, don't, if you take something that's going to depress the central nervous system, you're going to have side effects that are central nervous system related like constipation. Uh, and then we have classification by use. So sort of categories, law enforcement categories like uh, uh, drug facilitated sexual assault drugs, which the most common one would be alcohol, but then some of these other drugs are common. Uh, we talked about that in one of the homeworks, this gamma hydroxybutyrate GHB can be added to alcoholic drinks to, you know, jump the, the feeling or whatever uh, of alcohol. We had a student present on her and her brother's use of these sort of club drugs that they would take a bottle of GHB to the club and put it in their beer or whatever. And she said it would, it would like quadruple or more the effect. And, and so they would, you drink one beer and it's like you've had six. Okay. And yeah. And she said it was really dangerous. A capful full would, would be enough. And she, the reason she was speaking on the college campus was at this party, her, her brother had a lot and he was um, going crazy and he grabbed the whole bottle and just took a drink out of the bottle of GHB. And again, it, the central nervous system depressant effect, he, he just stopped breathing is what he did. He passed out, his lips were blue. They couldn't get him to wake up and he died. And so she really, I mean, think of the impact, right? She and her brother are partying together all the time and then essentially their behavior caused him to die. And so, uh, you know, they were all, you know, law enforcement got involved and part of her uh, agreement in, in working off, you know, the, the sentence was to go around and speak on college campuses about these kinds of dangers of club drugs. And so she came here, it was a great presentation several years ago and it kind of, you know, informed me on that kind of scene. And I thought, wow, it's really dangerous. Uh, that's, so that's kind of what she was using these as club drugs. Um, they're perceived as less dangerous than hard drugs, but that again, the toxin is the dose. And then there's human performance drugs. We typically think of, of drugs of abuse as the drugs that have a psychological effect or, or you know, some sort of inhibition relieving effect. But there's also anabolic steroids, testosterone-based, uh, uh, you know, uh, steroids and prescription medicines that are used. So those are also part of the forensic evidence package. There was, uh, you know, regular testing of student athletes at the university level to make sure that they're not taking steroids. And one year at UT, which has a huge football program, as you might imagine, the NCAA was doing a big you know, urine testing thing down in the field house. I didn't know that. Okay. We're in the marching band and I'm on the field and I mean, I really got to go. Okay. And so I, I said to my section leader, I got to go to the bathroom. So I ran over to the field house and the door was locked, which was unusual. So I went around, I found a door open. So I opened it and I went in the hallway where there was an NCAA drug screening going on. And this guy yells at me, he's down at the end of the hall at a table. I guess he was the check-in guy. And I came in behind him and he said, what are you doing? And I said, I got to pee. And he goes, no, you don't. <laughs> he thought I was going to swap my urine out for one of the football players, <laughs> which would have helped him get past the drug test. I was just going to the bathroom. But yeah, they would be testing for these human performance drugs. And, and anyway, I got really yelled at. And so I had to go to a different place. Yeah, strange story, but that's, you know, it's, it's serious business, especially at that level of, of uh, sports. And then this is really sad, these opportunistic psychological effects, inhalants. So people huffing gasoline or just about anything, paint thinner. I mean, this is why if you're under 18, you can't go to the store and buy spray paint. You know, Thomas, when he finally turned 18, he's like, yay, I'm going to go buy a can of spray paint because he was always doing projects at the house, but I had to go buy the paint because he couldn't buy, you know, the, the paint. Um, 
And so that's that's just not good. I mean, it is good that they have age limits, but it's not good that they have to. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's pretty sad. And then they list it by schedule. So uh, like I said, in the federal government or any kind of government, that this idea of a schedule is really not like a date schedule. We think of a schedule as a calendar, but the schedule is just a table. And so these are drugs of abuse that are subject to regulation. And this goes back a ways. This is the uh, Controlled Substances Act of 1970. It's Schedule 1. These are the fines of, of possession or, or trade in a Schedule 1 substance from 0 to 20 years and 0 to a million dollar fine. And you can see here that they, they list these as no medical use, severe addiction risk, and these have LSD, heroin, MDMA, GHB, and marijuana is still at the federal left level listed as a Schedule 1 substance which has just been that way for years, even though certain states are, are making it legal for recreational use. So they're really putting people in this really strange gray area. So do these schedules of kids be state by state and that's how they're changing these laws and moving it down? Or is this... This is just a broken thing right now. Oh. It's just broken. There's, you know, possession of marijuana is completely illegal at the federal level but it's not illegal in Colorado or California or, you know, and uh, medicinal marijuana in Oklahoma even. So it's just different states and I've got a, I've got a map on the next page, but that's, that's really a, a strange quandary we're at. And it's so f strange now, now that uh, normally at this point, I, I bring up this state's rights versus federal thing. And, and when it comes to marijuana, you know, most people are like states rights, you know, let the states decide. And then uh, at least in prior years, I would say, okay, now do abortion, right? They want the federal regulations to exist for abortion, but want states to be able to regulate marijuana. So it, it was inconsistent for a while there, but now that doesn't apply since Roe v. Wade has been struck down. But in, in the past, it was always this quandary for the students that they're like, no, I want the federal ruling to, to stand on this category, but not on this category. And so it's still something to think about. Do you, you know, do you want the states, do you want the federal government to be more hands off and let the states decide these things, which would be called federalism, which is strange, it sounds backwards, but federalism is the government to stay in its little federal box and let the states be 50 experiments in constitutional freedom and, and let them decide, you know, how they want to govern their small little spots. Okay, that would be federalism, even though it sounds backwards. Okay. Um, so then uh, Schedule 2 has things like morphine, cocaine, amphetamine. Isn't it strange that like marijuana, which now is socially so much more acceptable than, say, morphine and cocaine? Yeah, it's so weird. And then uh, it has restricted medical use because morphine is still very, um, you know, valuable medicine, especially at end-of-life care for, for hospice when people are having a hard time to breathe. You, you have this uh, feeling of oxygen starvation, just like you have a starvation for food and you'll, you will eat, it's literally eat dirt because you're so hungry. They make dirt cookies in some countries because the, it relieves the, the hunger pains, even though it really doesn't have any nutrition. Um, that's how hungry some people are. Uh, for, for oxygen starvation, same kind of thing. You just feel like you can't get a breath because you really aren't getting enough oxygen. Your lung function has dropped. And morphine really helps with that oxygen starvation feeling. Uh, it just takes the edge off and they dose it appropriately so that you, you're comfortable. And that's uh, done in end of life care. So morphine is a very valuable medicinal substance that can also, leave, also be, uh, be abused. That's why it's restricted. I don't know of the medical use of cocaine or amphetamine. <laughs> I mean, I don't know, but it's there, okay. Then this uh, accepted medical use, things like steroids, ketamine, some codeine preps, like cough syrup. Um, and then again, schedule four would be Valium and sleeping pills. And then over-the-counter substances is schedule five, things like uh, uh, Tylenol Plus, which has uh, codeine in it. Here's the legal status of, of a few years ago for um, Kratom, uh, 2016. They, they tried to publish an intent to schedule Kratom as a Schedule One drug, and then that order was rescinded. And so now there's no, there's no breaks on Kratom at this point. Uh, in some states there are. It's, it, it's restricted 
in eight states and illegal in five states as of the date of her PhD work. Um, but it's legal in 32 states. So. Um, this is probably the most, I would say, testable one. So this is on the homework, and you, you know, you can imagine that this is something that I can easily test you on. And that would be classification by the type of evidence that comes in the door. So we typically think of these as the five P's. So there's powders, you know, it can be the classic white powder, but it can also be like a brown powder. It can be tarry or oily. Um, it could be odiferous or, or goo, like plant matter is a, can, you know, just take a, like we had celery sitting on the counter for way too long and it was gooey. I mean, I was like, let's get this out of here, it's nasty. So, you know, plant matter over time really starts to turn to goo. Um, and that's the second one, plant matter, that moldy goo, uh, marijuana, leaves, stem seeds, you know, think about my uh, catnip under the seat, you know, <laughs> it was dry, dried leaves. And so that you know, they put acronyms for everything, like green vegetative material, GBM, or GPLM, green plant-like material. It's plant-like. It's old and nasty, so was it really a plant? Well, what else would it be? It's, it's a plant-like material. Um, and then pills, obviously. And there's a physician's desk reference, which we'll look at next time. And it's just got pictures of all the different kinds of pills. So you can buy this book, and most of the pharmacists might... Uh, a graduate school roommate was going to be a pharmacist. And so he had this book that was, you know, two or three inches thick. And it was just pill after pill after pill. And he had to be able to recognize them on site, know what the active ingredient was, know what the doses were, and know what it should not be coupled with. So if he's asked to fill a prescription for somebody and he's looking at it, he's like, oh, they shouldn't take that with that. You know, they, they really are a, a huge safety net because think of all the different doctors you may have. You know, you got a pulmonologist and you got a cardiologist and you got a general practitioner and then you got an allergy doctor and then you got a dermatologist. You're going to all these different folks and they're all writing you scripts. And yes, they should look at your full profile, but how are they going to get it? How's your dermatologist going to get the heart medicine information from your cardiologist? So we got kind of a weird setup. I mean, it could always be improved, right? And there's lots of things that we can improve about our medical system. Uh, but that pharmacist is a real critical piece. So if all of your prescriptions go to the Walgreens in Huntsville or wherever, you know, then maybe your pharmacist is a, a good line of defense to say, wait a second, this is your list of medications. You really shouldn't, you know, be doing this one. Let's get your um, get your general practitioner involved and see if he can go over your meds and see what combination would work for you. <clears throat> and then precursors. So these are the things that, that are um, like going into drugs. Like uh, if you're, um, if you go to the store and you try to buy a whole case of Sudafed, they're gonna probably ask questions because you don't need a whole case to treat a cold. Okay, and it would be a precursor to methamphetamine. Now, it's also a pill, so it would fit into two categories. It's a precursor for methamphetamine, but it's also a pill. But if they look in your, uh, in your trunk, you've got some pills, some methamphetamine pills, I mean, some, some Sudafed pills, and then you've also got, say, some uh, batteries, some lithium-ion batteries, and you've got some <laughs> starter fluid, which contains ether, and that's good for liquid-liquid extraction and you've maybe got some other solvents, and then you've got uh, a lot of salt, like Epsom salt or, or Morton's salt, and, um, and you've got you know, some bottles and tubing. I mean, these are precursors to clandestine drug activity. You know, there's nothing wrong with having a big jug of Morton salt, but if you combine that with the batteries and the anhydrous ammonia and all these different things, that's, you know, situationally looks like a meth lab. So those would be precursors. And then the equipment of abuse, things like syringes, cookers, and pipes, um, those would be paraphernalia. So that's the fifth P. So these are the most common evidence uh, exhibits. The top four, obviously, the green plant-like matter would be, um, would be marijuana. 
or suspected marijuana. It might be catnip. Uh, we have methamphetamine, cocaine, and heroin. Those are the big four that come in. Um, and there's regional differences. This is maybe a bit dated, but Southern California was, you know, mostly meth area, and Hawaii was big on marijuana, but now marijuana is everywhere. Um, and then there's strange exhibits, things like green solution with overwhelming smell. <laughs> and then the scary thing as a kid, they were some people in Fort Worth, or maybe it was nationwide, but we I was growing up in Fort Worth, and somebody had put razor blades in apples, you know, for Halloween. Now, what kind of psycho does that? You know, the kid bite into a razor blade. And so that that freaked me out as a kid, freaked my mom out. So maybe it was reverse. My mom freaked out and then I got freaked out by it. So they made us dump all our candy out and they like dug through it and made sure everything was in a wrapped, you know, wrapped up, no evidence of tampering or anything like that. If there was any kind of weird or squirrely candy, it went in the trash. You know. uh, so this was uh, a while back. This is the state of marijuana, so a legend, you know, state approval for medical and CBD medical. So that's what I was saying about California. Um, there's some CBD medical approval in Texas. Um, let's see. Decriminalization in the light blue and the dark blue stripes. Um, personal use is the green and red stripes. So all of the West Coast in Colorado. There may be some other states that have flipped over now. There's no regulation on it uh, in Kansas, South Dakota, Idaho. And that's what I was saying, just, you know, clipping that earlier slide that it's still a Schedule One federally, but, you know, not here. So there's really kind of a disjointed situation for marijuana. There's also non-drug components, so cutting agents and things that dilute it to... Um, make it look like a larger package and to um, stretch supply, maximize profits. There's also inactive ingredients and there's time release agents, binding agents, things that will allow the drug to survive the toxic environment or the, the destructive environment of the stomach. You know, if you, if, it, if you really have a better effect, if it makes it into the small or large intestine, then it's gonna be coated and it's gonna be able to survive that acidic environment. And then you can put things in to mask the absence of the drug. And this was in our earlier, we had cocaine and procaine. And when the cocaine went down, the caffeine went up. And that was, again, they were using caffeine to mask the absence of the cocaine. Since cocaine is a stimulant and so is caffeine, the caffeine was much cheaper. They could put that in, drop the cocaine amount, increase the caffeine amount, and, and sell it for the regular price and make more, make more money. And then the, these impurities are just anything that's not intentionally added. And so sometimes those impurities are solvents. So when they're reprocessing or processing the drugs, they will typically use organic solvents, and they're not necessarily the best chemists, and they might have entrained solvents in the crystals. So if you crash something out of solution quickly, uh, you're going to have potentially uh, some solid crystals with little pockets of solvent inside. These little occlusions are still full of some solvent. Now our, tech, our detection techniques are sensitive enough that we can put that in a hot environment and off gas that solvent and, and detect it. And so you can look at residual solvent analysis. Um, it's a little difficult in a sense because most of the time we set our instruments not to look for solvents. We want to ignore the solvent because that'd be the largest signal. So you have this mountain peak of a signal for the solvent, and then your active ingredients are tiny little peaks that follow along. But you could set up the system to look just for solvents, and this would be um, things that you could do to determine the, the uh, uh, geographic origin. So if you're, if you're trying to look for uh, profiling and finding, you know, where's the flow of this particular type of drug? Did it come in through Mexico or Canada or off the coast? Um, and here's just the solvent analysis, like toluene for, for um, cocaine exhibits was in 59% of the U.S. Uh, cases, but only 7% of Canada. And it looks like that, you know, if this was imported, it probably wasn't imported from Canada. It might have been imported from Europe someplace. Um, isopropanol, not seen in the U.S. cases or Canada cases, but in Switzerland. So different kinds of solvents, again, might give you regional information. And it would be uh, listed as, as this impurity. Okay, so that's the category that it would fall under. 
Now let's get to the toxicology piece. So this is not just studying the drugs, but also the metabolites. So a lot of times the you might not detect the drug, or you might not even look for the drug. You're looking for the, the drug that's been processed by the liver or by the kidneys or just enzymes in the bloodstream. And, and there's you know several me metabolic pathways in the body and they produce different kinds of products. Um, so they'll take the drug and they'll add a hydroxyl group to it or they'll add a, they'll take a methyl group off. Uh, remember on the Kratom, we saw the drug and it looked like it had an acid group, but it was capped with the methyl. If we take that methyl off, then now we have an acid. And now it's gonna be more water soluble and it's gonna be eliminated by the kidneys faster. So that's what the body's doing. If it takes that methyl group off, now it can eliminate that substance. So metabolism is, is, is part of the, the body's response to all of these substances. Now the pharmacodynamics is how that drug interacts with the target and what it does and what effects it causes. And then the pharmacokinetics are what we're gonna study. We're gonna study the movement of the drug through the body and it's ADME, it's absorption, distribution, metabolism, and elimination. So we need to, if we're going to detect it in the body, we need to detect it before it's eliminated. Um, if we can't do that with the parent drug, maybe we can detect the metabolites when they're eliminated. And that's what most of these urine tests are testing for. They're testing for the metabolites of the drugs, and that indicates that the person was taking a drug. So these are the roots of entry. So it, think of all the different ways things can get into your body. Obviously, you can eat things, but you can inject things. You can breathe them in. Um, you could get them in your eye, and it could go into the body through the eye. A lot of gaseous substances will attack your eyes. I was in the stock room one time, and I saw HI, and I thought, oh, hydroiodic acid. You know, it, it exists, right? I mean, we have it in freshman chem in terms of our problems, but there it was, and I touched the bottle, and just the vapor of that acid going through the lid, my eyes started burning immediately. It was that volatile. And so, I mean, that's interocular absorption is another route of entry. Um, sublingual absorption. Has anybody ever taken anything under the tongue? There's a real common medicine that's used as some sublingual. And I think it's genius that they made this particular medicine sublingual. And it's fenugreek for nausea, uh, to relieve nausea. Now, doesn't that make sense if you're throwing everything up? You know, and sometimes you get a stomach bug. I mean, you think you're, you're going to see your toes come up, you know, it's so bad. And, and, and so why have a person try to take a tablet that's going to go in the stomach and then come right back up? And so this is a little tablet you put under your tongue and it just dissolves right under your tongue. If you lift up your tongue in the mirror, you see all of those blood vessels and veins under your tongue. This goes right through that real thin layer of skin and goes right into your bloodstream. Fascinating. So that's a sublingual absorption. And then now we have this, uh, um, uh, see it really doesn't show up here to patches, but yeah, transdermal absorption, they show the feet. But yeah, this is uh, the combination or, or comparison of taking a pill versus a patch. And so this is a sweet spot. This is made by um, a company that's sort of promoting the patch. Because if you take a pill, this this region here, between these two marks, that's the therapeutic window, right? And so if you don't take enough, you don't get into that therapeutic window. If you take too much, you're wasting it, right? It's going up above the therapeutic window. But if you want to have more of the drug in your therapeutic window, sometimes you have to take more. It goes above for a little while, but then it spends more time in this therapeutic window. If you were to ingest a drug that only went this high, it would come down fairly fast and you just wouldn't have much therapeutic effect. So they've got to kind of overdose you a little bit, not overdose like to kill you, but overdose you a little bit above that therapeutic window so that it has more time in the therapeutic window. Well, some of these transdermal applications, they, they rise up as, you're, as you sort of saturate the skin with that, that substance. And then it, it's, it's dosed in terms of the diffusion from the adhesive where the, the uh, pharmacological agent is in the adhesive and, and it's made to, to slowly go through the skin and into the body and stay within that therapeutic window longer. 
So this has uh, become really advanced science. Again, that's the best case scenario. And I don't know that they're all that perfect. And so this is ADME, that absorption is what's going on here, these different routes of entry. And, and it's absorption, not adsorption. So uh, think about the, the absorption versus adsorption, uh, the D versus, uh, versus B. That's what I'm saying. AD is adsorption, AB is absorption. Okay. Um, the way I think of it is with the pi. So uh, adsorption is on the surface, that's a pie in the face. And absorption with a B goes in the body, you eat it. So think about B in the body, absorption goes in the body. Okay. Once it's in the body, it's distributed, so that's the D. Uh, if it doesn't go into the bloodstream, it's not distributed very quickly. So fat-soluble drugs are really hard to distribute. Okay. And that's why most of the time they're um, injected into the muscular tissue um, or even it's subcutaneous uh, into the fat just under the skin. And that becomes like a time release as they go into, um, into the bloodstream slowly. Um, a lot of those uh, are not ingestible, like morphine, if you ingest it, most of it stays in the, in the GI tract and doesn't be, isn't absorbed very well. But anyway, it's distributed most likely through the bloodstream and then it's stored. The storage could be in the fatty tissues. A lot of these organic molecules like the fatty layer. They're pretty hydrophobic unless they're ionized. And then as they're going through the bloodstream, what do they pass? They pass through the liver, which is really acting like a filter for the bloodstream, or they pass through the kidneys, which is also a filter. The, the liver is a real active filter. <clears throat> it's metabolizing and changing the substances, adding OH groups, taking off methyl groups, doing these different kinds of things that, that the enzymes are doing in the liver, and then making it more water-soluble and more easily eliminated by the kidneys. And that's where you um, can sometimes take advantage of those different uh, areas of the body and the different metabolism routes. Um, if you have a high fever and you want to manage that fever with uh, ibuprofen and Tylenol, that's why those are such a good combination. Ibuprofen is metabolized by the kidneys. It goes pretty much straight through the kidneys and out. And Tylenol is metabolized by the liver. And so you can take Tylenol for a course and while the liver is working on the Tylenol, before it's completely gone, but your fever starts to come back up, you can take an ibuprofen. And so you're not stressing all of your kidneys or all of your liver you're able to kind of overlap those two drugs because they're hitting different organs in the metabolism step. And then once it's metabolized and it goes to the kidneys, uh, then it's eliminated. So uh, most of these drugs, if they've been absorbed in some way into the bloodstream, they have to go out through the kidneys. And with this storage, you know, it, those last the longest. So you can really detect some of these metabolites from marijuana use, specifically for months and months and months. The effect is gone. You, you went to Amsterdam, you had a good time with marijuana or Colorado or California. And then months later, because those substances were, were stored in your fatty tissues, they're still leaking out and they're still in your urine and they can be detected months later. This, this would be that half-life of elimination. So this is absorption and distribution. Um, I, I really show this steeper curve because that's uh, most of the routes of entry would be fast. This absorption, this really gradual one might be something like a transdermal rise. Um, but you have this absorption distribution. Then you have this CP, which is the peak plasma concentration. So you see that over here, plasma concentration, milligrams per liter. And this is the overall uh, uh, pharmacological metabolism uh, uh, equation. You can work with this uh, with algebra. You can move CP over here, move volume of distribution down here, and you could calculate if you knew the dose in milligrams, the body mass in kilograms, the, the apparent volume of distribution uh, in liters per kilogram. Uh, you could calculate the plasma concentration. So there's some homework problems with this equation, so you can put a star by this page. But once you pass that peak concentration, then you start seeing this elimination. And most of the time, 
your enzymes are working at a first order kinetics. So it's that same first order kinetics equation you guys are familiar with. It's super easy. Here's the equation up here. The absorption and, and distribution can follow this. Again, it's that e to the x. We have the, the natural log of two over the, the half-life, and this is time. And so that's this blue curve. It's coming up to its maximum concentration. But before it gets there, it's already starting to be eliminated by this one. e to the minus time over uh, the, the uh, half-life times the natural log of two. And so that would be the metabolism elimination kinetics, and that's the red curve. And so your ADME curve looks like this green curve. You have a sharp rise from the ingestion and distribution, and then you have this gradual elimination. So it never goes up to the maximum amount. It hits this peak right here, which would be your peak plasma concentration. So you can put these equations in Excel and, and have fun with it. Talking about that elimination half-life in the body, some of them were quite long. So this is from an industrial hazards book, Sachs's uh, Handbook of Occupational and Safety Health. Uh, and these are the half-lives of a lot of industrial toxins. So this really isn't related to drugs and toxicology, but it's related to workplace health. And you can see up here benzene and toluene and so on. And this is detection in blood. Um, and these are the half-lives in the body. So. Uh, the diamonds are, are blood and the circles are urine. And this is, uh, again, half-life in the body. So you would need to know the half-life in the body, and these would be the techniques you could use to detect them. So you could detect, you know, carbon monoxide. Half of that carbon monoxide exposure would be gone in under 10 hours, you know, so maybe about four hours. Here's uh, mercury poisoning. So mercury poisoning, you get rid of mercury. I mean, it's slow. Half of it would be gone in a week. Okay, so if you got an acute uh, ingestion of mercury in some way, uh, it would be in your body. Half of it, you know, every week, half of it would go away. And you could detect that in the blood for quite a while. Um, ten half-lives would be about ten weeks. So you could detect that mercury in your blood for up to ten weeks. And the whole time it's probably wreaking havoc on your central nervous system. Uh, the longest one on this chart is cadmium. And so that's 10 years, over 10 years. So, and again, you could detect that cadmium in the bloodstream for 10 years. It's a heavy metal toxin. It's going to bind irreversibly to, to sulfur groups, and a lot of your enzymes depend upon sulfur bridges. And so that's what heavy metal toxicity does. It wrecks a lot of your enzymes. So if you have that in your bloodstream, you're going to have a hard time with a lot of your metabolism. This is the typical toxicological treatment. We talked about the dose uh, level, the, the uh, pharmacologically relevant level that we wanted. Um, if we go above that, we get into the adverse effects. Um, so below this level is no adverse effect level. We want the clinical level to be below the no AEL, <laughs> okay? So that we get a clinical effect or you know the pharmacological effect before we have any kind of adverse effects. But some of the adverse effects are, um, are uh, I would say prevalent, but, but not disastrous. You know, like again, we talked about the constipation from opiates. If you really had to have opiates, then you're gonna also have to have uh, something to handle the side effect. And so there might be, you know, the lowest uh, adverse effect level is the clinical level for a particular prescription of opiates is right here. And this is what we're looking at. Instead of death, uh, we're looking at constipation. You're going to have that, that lowest observed effect, and you're going to need to take some sort of laxative. If we're talking about death as the effect, then this would be the LD50. So at, at, some, at some dose here uh, would, be, um, would be the LD50, or the 50% of the population is expected to die. Above here is the Frank effect level. Notice it's not at one, it's maybe like at 95%. Um, and so we'd say, yeah, if you got a dose there, 95% of the time, you're not gonna survive. There's still cur a curve there, so there may still be people that survive that level of dosage, but it's not expected. And then there's hypersensitivity, hypersensitivity and accumulation. So this is what we mean by allergies. So when you get a hypersensitivity to something, then your dose response is really off the charts. 
because what it's doing is it's telling your body to react. It's not really an effect of the substance in terms of its toxicity. It's the substance is triggering your own immune response. And so you're starting to have huge effects like some of the peanut and tree nut allergies. Um, you know, people that, that are allergic to latex, probably peanuts and tree nuts. Uh, my Jennifer's cousin got uh, sensitized to latex. She went through all her degree at, at uh, Texas State, got her med tech degree and became a, a, a tech in the hospital running samples and so on. And everybody was using latex gloves and she inhaled enough of the powder from the latex gloves that her body decided that was a foreign substance that needed a full blown immune response. And so she had to quit her job. She had to take a totally different career because of her latex allergy. And it was so bad. We went to a little fair, um, which, you know, like these rooms, 121 and 103, there was a room that big that had vendors in it. You know, the fair, they have little vendor tables and so on. And she, we walked in that room, just walked in the door and she saw latex balloons in the corner of the room. And she's like, I got to go get my EpiPen. And, and so she needed a shot of adrenaline to keep her lungs open because their throat started closing up. And she barely made it to the car. She was walking, it was that sensitive. Now, how much dose did she get of that latex? Just a tiny little protein powder of that natural rubber and her body went nuts. Yeah, so anyway, so they can be quite, uh, quite severe. That's hypersensitivity. Um, you can also develop it from isocyanates, and this is forensically relevant because a lot of those um, super glues have some isocyanates in them. And so be careful with that. Use it in a cabinet. Don't get exposed because you don't want to go through all of this, get a job in a crime lab, and become allergic to the tools that you're using. So chemical exposure is really important, especially for some of these substances that can cause a hypersensitivity. So be careful of the super glue fogging and all of that. Always follow the directions and use the cabinets and, and don't be flippant about it because yeah, is it enough to cause you an adverse effect just from that little dose? Probably not. You know, if you're treating it like any other thing, a little bit on your finger, not a big deal. But the isocyanates can certainly create a hypersensitivity and make you allergic. And now all bets are off. So any small exposure to it then can cause your face to break out and everything with a rash. We had a, a person in Pentex get hypersensitized to the isocyanates and had to change their jobs. It can no longer be a chem tech. So it was really, really sad. Now, uh, we talked about the heavy metals and, the, and we talk about radiation. Uh, in PCHEM2, but if you guys don't take PCHEM2, uh, I just want to talk about that. Uh, radiation is not a, we talk about doses of radiation, but there it's not a substance that you're absorbing. There's no metabolism of the radiation, but radiation is more like an injury. So like a sunburn. So think about a sunburn. If you get a really bad sunburn, that's a radiation burn. And what happens to your skin? It kills the skin cells. And what happens to all that dead cellular material? You have to metabolize it. And if there's enough of it, you'll run a fever. You'll have a white blood cell count will be elevated. You'll see all kinds of things going on in your body that, that are responses to the cellular damage that you get. But it's not anything that you can become allergic to because you would be allergic to any kind of cells in your body that die, you know. I mean, maybe there's some strange condition out there, but it's not a typical thing that you can become allergic to. And so uh, think of radiation poisoning or radiation doses more as an injury like a sunburn. Now, some of the radiation penetrates quite deep, gamma rays and beta rays. And then if you ingest alpha particles, you could then have the sunburn on your organs, like your stomach, your intestines, and so on. And that's a really, uh, that's like the worst case scenario because your body has to basically dismantle all of that tissue. And if it's enough, then the whole organ can be lost. So you could like burn your stomach and lose your stomach. And, and that would, I don't know how you survive that. So there's, you can have lethal doses of radiation, but that's how it's lethal. It destroys certain organs in your body. Oh, again, that toxin is the dose. So it's, it's more like a, a, um, an injury. And for alpha radiation of ingestion, 
this, this multiplier is 20. So for x-rays, gamma rays, and beta radiation, this multiplier is one. So you go get an x-ray, they measure your dose, and they don't multiply it by anything. If you ingested that same amount of radiation in an alpha particle and it was out in your stomach, you get 20 times the damage. So that's not good. And so this is the threshold for radiation. Uh, you have 25 rem threshold where you have no detectable clinical effects. Above that, you start to see, again, this um, response to the dead tissues. Um, decrease in white blood cell count or maybe nausea if it's high enough. And then 50 rem is the death of half the exposed population. Now, how do we prevent this? Well, we wear dosimeters. We wear film badges because the radioactivity will expose film. And so you can wear a little plastic badge that the radiation goes through, exposes the film, and then they go read how much it's exposed. So they have these, what they call densitometers. They measure how dark the film is, and then they uh, can tell how much radiation you got hit with. And they remove you from your duties if you're, you know, um, like 150, 200, or maybe uh, 500 millirem per year, which is really low. So one, you know, this is 25,000 rem, and they pull you off your duties if you hit 500 rem. So not even one rem will pull you off your duties. Now, in terms of the detecting of kraton and the metabolites of that, this is some of the in instrumentation that Stephanie had in her thesis. This is a liquid chromatography, so LC, MS, but it's got a couple of mass specs in there. It's got a a quadrupole MS, and then this is a time of flight MS. So they have a detector up here that's charged, and let's say it's negatively charged, and you make cations out of your drugs, and then they're accelerated and they fly up this tube and hit the detector. And so you have a really long tube, which gives you high resolution. Now I just wanted to show you this, just to show you some of the, um, the analytical uh, items that we've covered so far in her thesis. So here's, uh, Here's the LC part. So we have these different columns and information and flow rates and the gradients and so on in the, in the uh, liquid phase. Then you have the, the quadrupole um, gases and so on, the acquisition times, and then the mass spec and, and different collision energies, which we could go into. But, but this is the, the, uh, one of the examples of liquid chromatograph data that has um, uh, all these analytes in urine. So look how good the separation is, all the way back down to the baseline between each analyte. So that's a really good method. And then if you sit on one of these and look at the um, at the mass spec, let's look at this metragenine. These are all the different ions that you would get. So the metragenine molecular ion would be here. And then look how she's displayed it. If you split it here or split it here, you get these different fragments. And so as that goes into the time of flight, <clears throat> Before it gets there, it goes into a collision chamber and it impacts at high energy, like a helium gas or something, and it breaks the molecule up in a consistent way. And then it goes into that high resolution time of flight and you can measure the different masses of these fragments. Uh, these were the validation criteria. So remember we said that the limit of detection was three times your blank and that's what she's using, the signal to noise for the limit of detection. So whatever your blank signal or noise was, three times that would be the limit for your detection. The limit of quantitation was 10 times, so it was a 10 to 1 signal to noise. A carryover, this was interesting. So you run your sample, um, and then you run a, a blank and see if you get any peaks. Like, if, is there anything stuck on the column? So like if you overload the column, it'll carry over to the next run. Think how bad that would be. You want your sample going after someone who had a huge amount of drugs in their urine and it shows up on your sample? <laughs> oh, God, I didn't have any, really. And that might be why they run the split, right? Okay, they detect a drug, a testosterone in your urine, and then they run your second split and there's nothing. And so like, okay, it's a problem. The split didn't show the same signal. Um, and then anyway, so these are some of the analytical parameters that we've talked about. And then this is the metabolism piece. So here's metragenine, okay? And these are the different enzymes in the body, these different, uh, uh, you know, cytoproteins that are in the bloodstream. And they're all, what's wonderful is that we know about all of these different enzymes and we, uh, we incubate them with these different enzymes and we see what comes out. And so that's what she did in her project, amazing. So, 
So this one took this uh, molecule and notice it, it took this methoxy off and put an OH. And it took this methyl off and made that carboxylic acid. So there'd be a demethylization here and a demethylization there. Um, up here, just one demethylization. See, so demethyl metragenine. Here it added a, a hydroxyl group right there. So that was a hydroxy metragenine. So it put a, in this spot right there, it put an OH, making it a little more water soluble, making it a little bit easier for the kidneys to eliminate. So that's what these metabolites are doing. They're just changing the molecule just by a little bit, and it's, it's promoting its elimination. And then here, this is a uh, uh, cis-carboxy. So I guess it just still demeth demethylated that, that, uh, that carboxylic acid. So, and then these enzymes will work, you know, two different pathways. One goes straight, one goes up here and then down. So, so that's, I just thought it would be nice to have that little added extra uh, bits, especially the metabolite stuff. So I'll make sure those notes are up on the website. And if you want, um, uh, I'll reach out to her and see if it's okay. But I think so. It's a public document. I'll put her thesis up there. So you can kind of read through some of the highlights.